And now I would like to introduce Deborah Slayton, coordinator of the Historic Preservation CRG, who will be introducing our presenter today. Deborah. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of Paul Gaudet, who is the coordinator of the Concrete Structure TRG and is unable to give this introduction due to technical difficulties with our phone system. In today's webinar, Don Meinheit will present Historic Concrete Reinforcing Bars and Bar Systems, which is an overview of late 19th and early 20th century concrete reinforcement systems. This presentation summarizes some of Don's work with the Concrete Reinforcing Steel Institute, CRSI, to create a book on this topic. Don will focus on three aspects of reinforced concrete construction from this era. Early reinforcing steel bars, early reinforcing bar systems for beams, columns, and one-way slabs, and two-way flat slabs. Don's presentation is part of a collaboration between the Historic Preservation TRG and the Concrete Structure TRG. This is the second part of the two presentation series on the development of the concrete construction industry. The first part, History of Concrete, was presented earlier this year and is available on the webinars area of the portal under knowledge sharing. Don? Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Paul. Uh, our discussion today is going to evolve as, as Deborah indicated. Uh, it is part of a book that is being prepared by the Concrete Reinforcing Steel Institute, uh, CRSI, and they're writing a book on vintage reinforcement. CRSI is made up of uh, bar producers, those organizations that roll, produce steel and roll the bars, the form bars, and the bar fabricators. They've been uh, a trade association since 1924. The CRSI book is expected to be frequently revised as new historic information gets submitted to CRSI. CRSI currently has two publications on uh, old systems. One is called Evaluation of Reinforcing Steel Systems in Old Reinforced Concrete Structures. That was published in 1981. And the other is Evaluation of uh, Reinforcing Bars in Old Reinforced Concrete Structures. That one was published in 2001. Uh, this vintage book will uh, replace that, those two publications. The objectives today are to have you learn about the history of reinforcing steel products produced in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and to uh, then discuss reinforcing steel material properties Review the system of assembled reinforcing bars for beams, girders, columns as used in the early part of uh, the tw 20th century, and then review the United States innovation called the girderless floor. Uh, my outline today will start out with a brief history of reinforced concrete design, uh, the material properties of the reinforcing steel, design codes, the bar, and then we will discuss some of the bar shapes and sizes, not all of them that will be included in the, in the book, and the, the, some of the reinforcing bar systems for beams, girders, and columns, and one-way slabs, as well as the girderless floor. In about 1849, in England, Level constructed a boat. Uh, he basically plastered mortar onto a, a, a bar armature, and that rowboat was exhibited at the Paris World's Fair in 1855. In 1867, a patent was taken out in France by our friend Joseph Manier, who was a gardener, and he really is accredited with the development of reinforced concrete because he used reinforced concrete to build tanks and flower pots and uh, uh, other things. Uh, surprisingly enough, he left that industry and got into the uh, construction of uh, reinforced concrete buildings. In the United States, although a little behind uh, the Europe, European uh, expertise, in 1874, uh, 
a engineer out in California by the name of Ernest Ransom began using old wire rope and hoop iron to make reinforced concrete structures. In 1877, Thaddeus Hyatt published some uh, initial experiments in the United States on reinforced concrete in beams and columns. Uh, 1884, Ransom uh, uh, got his first patent on his patented uh, square twisted bar. And by the 1890s, Ransom was building uh, reinforced concrete floor slab structures as well as buildings. The, the, this work was uh, um, all, of course, done without any code. The Europeans were also developing uh, reinforced concrete at the same time, but the, in the United States, we, we basically developed and understood how to design reinforced concrete in the last decade of uh, the 1800s. This is a, um, a picture of uh, Thaddeus Hyatt's uh, patent in 1878. Uh, he understood that there was a need to develop a bond between the reinforcing steel and the concrete. So much of this looks like uh, uh, dowels uh, on reinforcing bars that are subjected to shear, which transfer load from uh, the piece of steel to the concrete. He also, of course, uh, uh, used the shapes that were typically available from steel mills, in this case, the round bars and rectangular uh, plates. Uh, he also was able to uh, develop a corrugated plate and, and lugs on the corrugated plate such that he could develop a bond between the steel and the concrete. This is a, a, a picture of Ernest Ransom's patent in 1884. It is the square twisted bar, and, and, and the square twisted bar was, the twisting was all done cold. So the, the, the reinforcing bar comes to the project site as a, as a um, square bar, untwisted, and they field twist the bar at, at the site. So he patented a, a square twisted bar for use in building construction. And the photograph on the lower left is a photograph that James Lawan gave me earlier uh, last week of a inspection opening that he made in the building of, in Chicago where square twisted bars uh, were used. It's uh, surprising that Ernest Ransom, uh, his patent beginning in 1884, uh, progressed through about the mid-1920s before his, his, the labor cost to, to cold twist these bars became too much and uh, other deformed reinforcing bars took their place, took its place. Our code really has developed over the last century. But before we got to developing a code, there were a couple of organizations that uh, existed or were, were formed. And in 1902, there was an organization called the Association of American Portland Cement Manufacturers. These were the mills that produce, or the, the plants that produce Portland cement in the United States. Their acronym is AAPCM. Uh, shortly afterward, and we, we had the manufacturers organized, and shortly afterward, in, in uh, 1904, the users got organized and formed what was called the National Association of Cement Users, NACU. Uh, just six years later, NACU produced standard number four, which is the standard building regulations for the use of reinforced concrete. This is our first uh, reinforced concrete code, and it contained a whole 12 pages. In uh, 1913, uh, the users decided that that acronym was too many letters, so they shortened it to just three, and those three letters are very um, familiar to many of us, the American Concrete Youth Institute, the ACI, has been and is celebrating that name this year. It's 100 years old. Uh, in 1916, the Cement 
uh, manufacturers also change their name to something that is very familiar for anybody working in the concrete industry, and that is the Portland Cement Association. The uh, first code got revised in 1920 as uh, standard number 23. Uh, it kept the same name, standard building regulations for use of uh, reinforced concrete. Uh, I don't have it in here because it doesn't necessarily it doesn't show up uh, frequently as a code, but there was a revision to that 1920 code in 1928, but they were all the term tentative regulations, and uh, by that, that, those tentative regulations uh, existed through 1936 when ACI publishes a new code called Building Regulations for Reinforced Concrete under the auspices of ACI 501. 501 was the first committee that um, was, was designated to develop a reinforced concrete building code. Uh, in, in 1941, the ACI publishes another code, uh, Building Regulations for Reinforced Concrete, and the, co the committee number has now changed to ACI 318, and the, our ACI 318 committee is still in the process of publishing uh, uh, the Reinforced Concrete Code. For. Since 1941, we've had a number of different changes to the code. This lists the, the, the issuances of uh, building codes, and if you look at the last few years, we're doing it on a three-year cycle, fundamentally because that's uh, the, the IBC uh, cycle. In the first uh, 30 years, we published about four codes, so the, the cycle was somewhere between seven and a half and eight years. In the last 70 years, we've, we've published the code uh, basically on, on average of, of five years. So uh, there's been a lot of development of the Reinforced Concrete Building Code since uh, um, uh, 1910, uh, and, and significant developments since about 1963. 1963 was the last building code that used working stress design uh, procedures. It also introduced a strength design approach. So the 1971 code was the first all strength design uh, code. The uh, 2011 code will be the last code that uh, is published that is in the format of uh, behavior such as columns uh, or uh, axial load, bending, shear, slabs, and so forth. The new 2014 code will be reorganized into a member um, format, so there will be chapters on uh, bending, uh, uh, beams, columns, diaphragms, shear walls, seismic, and a couple of uh, toolbox chapters that, that include development of reinforcing bars. Prior to 1911, uh, all of the reinforcing steel was rolled and manufactured in accordance with the manufacturer's standards. In other words, the, the, the people producing, the, the organization that was producing the reinforcing bar did it to their own standards. They used um, old railroad, uh, railroad rails, they re-rolled them, basically uh, that this was a, a means by which you can split the, the railroad rail into three pieces, the head, the web, and the flange. The head was very ideal to make, to ro heat up and roll into reinforcing bars. The web um, starts out rectangular, so uh, many of the rolling mills or the uh, changed or took the web and made fence posts out of them, and the flange was uh, of enough beef such that they could uh, re-roll those and make angles out of them. Uh, we've also used uh, axle-grade steel. Uh, railroad cars have uh, axles and, and automobiles have axles, and if you take that steel and re-roll it, it, it was used for reinforcing bars. There was also some new billet steel. New billet steel means it was made from a, a raw iron ore to, to make the uh, billet, which was then rolled in, in um, rolls to produce a reinforcing bar. 
prior to uh, 1911, the steel was high carbon steel. Uh, its ultimate tensile strength varied between about 60 to 90 KSI. The yield point was, was not a designated value, but uh, somewhere around uh, and a minimum of 55% of the ultimate. The actual manufacturer had to be consulted to determine what the yield point was. And when you got to the point of using cold uh, form twisted bars, the cold working changed the yield point to uh, uh, 50 KSI and the ultimate to, to uh, 85 KSI. Bars were also bent cold around a pin that was uh, three diameter, three times the, the bar diameter or the side of the bar. Uh, and uh, to show that the steel was not brittle, it had to be bent around that uh, uh, pin diameter without breaking. That's a relatively tough uh, requirement for um, steels that basically were made with high, high carbon steel. And old re, uh, reinforcing old railroad rails. The first ASTM uh, specification for reinforcing steels came out in 1911, and it had a designation of A15. Uh, therefore, we uh, the pre-1911 steel and the post-1911 steel uh, had the post-1911 steel has a ASTM standard associated with ASTM A15. Uh, existed, to my knowledge, up to about 1960. Uh, when you looked at the document that was uh, produced in 1911 for A15, it said that you could use a uh, ladle analysis to measure the carbon, magnesium, and phosphorus and sulfur content of, of the, the steel, but it didn't really specify any of those metallurgical requirements. The only thing that was specified was that the phosphorus content, content had to be less than a certain percentage. And it depended upon the, the mechanism that was used to um, make the steel, either in a Bessemer process or an open hearth process. If you now look at uh, ASTM A61512, um, 100 years later, and you look at the heat analysis, the only thing we, the ASTM specifies is the phosphorus content. It ha and it has to be less than six hundredths of a percent. But we don't make it with open hearth or the Bessemer process anymore. We now make uh, all of our reinforcing bars uh, with an electric arc furnace. These are the uh, uh, strength requirements that were in ASTM A15 in 1911. Uh, tensile strength, there's four columns here. Um, Ignore for the moment the intermediate grade. In 1911, we, we had structural grade steel and hard grade steel and the cold twisted square bar. Uh, the tensile strength varied from 55 to about 80,000 PSI. And, and for the structural grade steel, 33 KSI was the norm. Hard grade steel was 50. And the cold twisted bar was 55. In 1914, uh, they added an intermediate grade uh, of four, with a yield of 40 KSI and ultimate between 70 and 80 KSI. As the strength increased, the elongations decreased. In other words, it became a more brittle steel. And it also had, uh, uh, that it also had to prove that it could be bent around a, a test pin to avoid being, uh, to show that it was not brittle. And these uh, test pin diameters are tough numbers to meet in today's standard. The cold twisted bar had to go around a diameter of two times the, the uh, side face of, of a bar. That is not an easy spec. We also want to point out that uh, this requirement applied to not only plain but also deformed reinforcing bars. So uh, ma manufacturers had to produ were producing plain bars as well as deformed reinforcing bars. The 1912 ASTM A615, uh, the 15 I think it, uh, comes from the 1911 spec and they added just uh, a six in front of it. 
is now um, produced in three grades, uh, 40, 60, and 75. 75 is soon to be replaced by grade 80 steel. Uh, so there will be a yield strength of 40, 60, and 80 KSI. Uh, and again, as, as, the along, as the strength of the steel increases, the percent elongation decreases or the, the, it becomes a more brittle steel. And the test pin diameters now are, are considerably relaxed from those which existed in 1911. Not included in this chart are uh, ASTM A706, which is a weldable uh, reinforcing bar. The chemistry, the metallurgy, me metallurgy is highly controlled. It also has a, a, a nice uh, uh, elastoplastic stress strain curve, which uh, helps uh, design reinforced concrete in earthquake zones. It also doesn't include an A955, which is a, a stainless steel or uh, A996, which is rail and axle steel, or A1032, which is MMFX, which is a, actually a, a 100 grade reinforcing steel that is, is rolled and then heat treated. Now, reinforcing bars have been around ever since uh, uh, we have produced reinforced concrete. They, and many of them, have long been forgotten, but most of them, if they're on a building still uh, in service, are uh, still there. So they're forgotten, but they're not gone. The, the, the following slides are going to go through uh, several of the types of reinforcing bars that are, were available pre-1911. Uh, the, these reinforcing bars um, um, in the book from CRSI, there's a total of about 40 different reinforcing bars that CRSI has been able to find uh, properties for and, and, and cross-sectional areas. It actually has uh, found a, a, about 200 different patents, and those patents will be part of the, an appendix for, with, in this book. But one of the first ones is the the uh, American deformed bar, it, um, it looks like a, a bamboo pattern, which is, uh, is still produced today. And it was produced by the American System of Reinforcing in Chicago. Um, not too different but of looking from what we see today, but the logs certainly are wider spaced and they're not as high uh, as they were uh, when, the, when this was first produced. Uh, Colombian bars were were rolled and produced for the Colombian Fireproof Company. The reinforced concrete was, was sold on the fact that it had a better fire resistance than uh, unprotected re uh, structural steel. And uh, the Colombian Fireproof Company rolled these cruciform or dumbbell-shaped bars and bent them and made their uh, reinforced concrete beams, slabs, and, and columns out of them. Johnson slash corrugated bars uh, uh, have been around at least since the construction of the Panama Canal. Um, I've seen one of the, the top uh, bars from the Panama Canal. Um, it was, it, so it, it was constructed about 1900. Johnson worked for the Expanded Metal and Corrugated Bar Company in St. Louis. Um, Actually, if you were in Northbrook today, you would see a, a, a sample of the, the center uh, round bar with uh, lugs and a very thick longitudinal uh, rib. The, this, this Johnson bar uh, evolved from the, the top figure to the bottom figure. It, the first uh, corrugations were indented. The, the bottom picture shows the, the reinforcing lugs as an external part of the uh, main body of the bar. Demand crimp bars were invented by Alphonse Demand. He started with using uh, rectangular um, bars and then he crimped them anywhere from, um, crimped them, in other words, turned them 90 degrees, uh, anywhere from two to four inches to, to re uh, represent a lug 
for bonding. He also um, patented a, a uh, undulating bar, uh, and that undulating bar uh, had changes of, of cross section. Um, Although the, the cross section remained constant, the, the, the position of the cross section changed, so it looked like it had a, uh, a deformation in it and produced a, a bond with the concrete. Our fr friend Alphonse is uh, accredited with uh, uh, the, the development of, or the creation of the Ackerman DCR uh, demand um, capacity ratio. Diamond bars uh, have existed for a long, long time. Uh, the Concrete Steel Engineering Company of New York was one of the very earliest producers. This diamond pattern is two intersecting spirals and was picked up by the Bethlehem Steel Corporation and was their standard reinforcing bar deformation until they went out of business in the early uh, 1970s. Alcani's bars are indented as opposed to have external lugs. Uh, they were <clears throat> the, the bar was rolled by the Carnegie Steel Company in Pittsburgh, and it, and this bar was uh, uh, invented by Eli Canis, hence Eli Canis uh, reinforcing bars. Havemeyer bars uh, were were very popular here in the Midwest because. Uh, one of the plants is the Illinois Steel Company in Gary that produced them. They came in three different shapes, uh, flats, rounds, and squares, and they had uh, protrusions on the side which uh, really are not lugs, but that they help to improve the bond. Many of these re early reinforcing bars um, had bond characteristics not much better than a smooth uh, uh, reinforcing bars. The, the typical bond stress used in the uh, for a round reinforcing bar is about uh, four percent of the concrete compressor strength and for the form bar at the same time is only about five percent of the uh, concrete compressive strength. So the, there, although there was a little change uh, basically they, the, 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 the two behaved pretty much uh, identically. Uh, it wasn't until 1950 when we uh, standardized the, the lugs to uh, create a, a specified lug height and spacing and, and had them all work on, on the same bond stress. Uh, to evaluate old reinforcing bars, a working stress of 200 PSI was frequently used. Um, many of these old systems worked fine. Uh, the, the, and, and they worked fine because the, the bond stresses were low, the, the uh, bar flexural stresses, the axial stresses in the bars were low, and they oftentimes had hooks which uh, provided a, a positive um, uh, anchorage. Inland or Buffalo bars were produced by Inland Steel Company, uh, another steel company that is no longer in business. The Inland Steel Company actually advertised one of their bars as being an inland bond bar compared to today's standards that it, it that basically behaves as if it were a uh, smooth bar. The buffalo deformed bar has got a bunch of X's on it which provide us some bonding characteristics but they're not really the lugs that we need today. One of the bars that probably performed pretty well was the con cup bar. This is an indented uh, bar. It, had, it was round and it had indented uh, deformations. It was produced by the Trust Concrete Steel Company of Detroit and invented by Julius Kahn. The name Kahn will be used frequently in this presentation because he had a great influence on the reinforced concrete industry in Detroit and the Midwest, as well as uh, in, in, to some extent in Europe. More often than not, the uh, um, con bar is associated with his con truss bar, which was used for longer spans and also in Europe. It had a cross section that uh, looked like that of the uh, in the lower left. Uh, they were square bars with um, flanges or wings on the side, and those wings were periodically sheared and bent upward to anchor the uh, bar 
for bond as well as to be used for um, stirrup reinforcement or shear reinforcement. The photograph is another picture that James Lewan gave me about a week ago, and it's a, uh, a con bar in a building here in Chicago, and you can see the uh, sheared off wing being bent up into the, the concrete beam. Uh, lug bars were, are, were basically square bars uh, rolled with lugs and then cold twisted, uh, produced by the General Fireproofing Company in Youngstown, Ohio. Again, another company uh, building buildings and selling them on the basis that it had a better fire resistance. Spiral bars were uh, uh, square bars with uh, rounded corners. It was believed that the, the sharp corner on a square bar uh, exacerbated the, the cracking characteristics of concrete, so the rounded corner was supposed to uh, uh, soften that impact. Frankly, the square bar uh, didn't, does not have a very, uh, the cold twisted square bar, whether it's got the rounded corners or not, it doesn't have a very good bond stress. So if you use 200 or 150 PSI for square bars, that's about what it, it on a working stress basis, that's about what it uh, is, is worth. Ovoid bars were produced by the Gabriel Reinforcement Company in Detroit. They're, uh, somewhat of an elliptical shape, and uh, it had a, a external deformation at uh, some spacing. Monotype bars were produced by Philadelphia Steel and Wire. They're cruciform in cross section and had but very little lugs on them, so this bar behaves fundamentally as a, a smooth bar. Thatcher bulb bars, or Thatcher, first of all, Thatcher riveted bars were probably the ones that came first. Um, they, Thatcher used uh, um, rectangular plates, punched holes in them, and drove a rivet in there to increase the bond characteristics. Uh, Thatcher, Thatcher roll bars uh, or bulb barbs were, were produced uh, and existed uh, before 1904 because it shows up in a book by Taylor and Sanford. Um, it basically, what it did, it took a round bar and squashed it every couple of inches to produce a, a deformation to enhance the bond. They also, uh, Thatcher also made uh, undulated bars like the man and uh, uh, created bond by the fact that the, the longitudinal edges of the bar um, uh, bore against the concrete. Bars were produced in many shapes and sizes, and if you can envision that if they had um, three different kinds of steel, upwards of uh, 15 different bar sizes, and in both plain and, and deformed shapes, if you do that arithmetic, a, a bar supplier could have as many as 130 different uh, reinforcing bars in, in stock for anybody to use. Uh, Reinforcing bars were generally produced to match standard round uh, bar diameters or standard square uh, bar size. So a standard round bar might be 3 8 half, 5 8 3 quarters, 7 8 and, and likewise for a, a, a square bar. So prior to 1917, bar producers were, were uh, producing and stocking 15 different sizes in perhaps two or three different grades and in, bo and in both um, plain and deformed shapes. Um, World War I came around and uh, there was a need to reduce the number of bar sizes and some simplifications. So in 1917 it began, to, the bar producers began to uh, work on a standardization of bar sizes. It took them to 1924 the same year the Concrete Reinforcing Steel Institute was organized, to come up with a, a simplified practice recommendation number 26 on steel reinforced bars. Um, the table of uh, bar sizes went from about 15 down to 11, and they did not produce all um, shapes in every, uh, diam uh, every size. So, 
uh, half inch square bars and one inch and one and an eighth, one three, uh, quarter um, square bars were produced, but uh, uh, they were, were not produced as uh, rounds. Interestingly enough, if you look at the lower right hand corner of, of this slide, you'll see that uh, this was produced by uh, uh, under the direction of the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Huber, who was also a civil engineer. The construction of reinforced concrete um, has, has spanned about 125 years. It started uh, in the United States with the William Ward's Castle in 1878. C Ward's Castle really didn't use reinforced concrete. What he did was he embedded uh, light structural shapes, like I beams, into the floor system, and he also used some round bars for basically um, the shrinkage and temperature steel. The building that gets most notoriety as being one, uh, and it is on the national list of uh, historic structures, is the Ingalls Building in Cincinnati, built in uh, 1906. Uh, the in in Ingalls Building is still there. Um, it was uh, built using the ransom system of reinforcing, so it's chock full of square twisted bars. And um, even Thomas Edison got into this business. He built some homes in 1908 in Gary, Indiana. I think they built 17 homes in Gary, Indiana, and Paul Gaudet says that the, some of them are still there. Uh, ransom on the West Coast was extremely active in, in producing reinforced concrete structures not only for floors but for columns and making big buildings. One of the largest buildings he built in eight, was the West Coast Borax Company Works in Alameda, California, 1898, 1899. Uh, he also produced one and made a building similar to this on the East Coast. That East Coast uh, building had a fire in it and it, it served as a, a very good example of the fire resistance of uh, of reinforced concrete. Uh, Ransom in 1891 built uh, a building in, at Stanford University, Robo Hall. Uh, unfortunately, this building was raised in 1917 uh, to make room for something else. The 1894 museum building on Stanford University is still there. I probably should ask John Frazak if he recognizes it. The, it is pro probably no longer uh, has the name museum building, but it is, is still on the campus of uh, Stanford University, built in 1894. The reinforced concrete was used for many things. Buildings in particular uh, were constructed of reinforced concrete. We we're going to talk about something uh, uh, that's called the girderless floor, which is the lower left-hand photograph flat uh, uh, soffits. Uh, this happens to be a, ha a picture of a Ham's Brewery in um, Wisconsin. And the, the picture above it is from uh, the, a, a John Deere plant in Omaha, Nebraska. Site fabrication of reinforcing bars was the norm. So you bring, bring um, bars to the site, you fabricated everything at the site, that's still the same thing we do in uh, New York City, as I understand it. We also do, they also did site mixing of uh, concrete um, in, in batches that were about a, uh, maybe two cubic yards in size. They were used in buildings, uh, in, in, in residences uh, in, on the East Coast as well as the West Coast. In stairs, stadiums, this happens to be the Syracuse University Stadium, but another uh, early stadium was one at, built in at Harvard University. Certainly, uh, when concrete could be sunk in water, it could be put in water, they were used for bridges, not only for railroads, but also for highways um, and in culverts. Uh, the top picture there um, is, is some pretty good architectural concrete. And it's made to look like uh, uh, cut stone. They were used for water reservoirs, for chimneys, for pipe, silos and bunker. And, and we still make uh, concrete pipe today. Very, very um, large use of uh, reinforced concrete pipe, reinforced with um, 
welded wire reinforcement. Also in pavements. Uh, pavements uh, is the area that PCA is emphasizing now. Uh, the concrete was site mixed. And the picture on the uh, upper right, uh, the, the upper left part of that shows a, a sheen on the, on the surface. That's, got, uh, that's been finished concrete. And the lower right uh, part of that photograph uh, shows a welded wire reinforcement laid on top of not sub-base, but uh, uh, a, a very coarsely graded concrete. Um, the procedures used for pavements initially were to get the surface very smooth, so they took out most of the coarse aggregate for a top surf, uh, topping course. There's a two-stage, two-course construction. If you ever find an old reinforce an old sidewalk, you might be able to see a um, the cross section made with very um, coarsely bound together material on the bottom, and the top is uh, nothing but uh, mortar. We also made railroad ties in the 1910s. They were not very successful because we couldn't pre-stress them very well. Although the picture on the, the, the sketch on the left does show a rod going through it, and the intention was to provide some pre-stress. Uh, they weren't very successful because we couldn't get the, the, the pre-stress high enough with the materials that we had at the time. We even took care of our agrarian friends by uh, showing them how to make fence posts uh, out of uh, reinforced concrete. And uh, so they didn't have to use creosote to uh, paint the bottom of their wood fence posts and, and ex be exposed to uh, a carcinogen. Um, co a concrete fence post uh, I know still exists. They, they definitely had a longer surface life than the creosote uh, wood post. Uh, some of these fence posts uh, are, I'm sure, 80 to 90 years old. They definitely had more surface life than uh, a wood uh, post. We made concrete masonry units. We made concrete masonry units with all kinds of different shapes and surfaces. Some of the foundation uh, in, in homes here in Chicago have, have a like it looks like it's a, a rough cut piece of stone. We also made poles, piles, foundations, retaining walls, water treatment facilities, dams, aqueducts, and of course, uh, sidewalks out of uh, concrete. In uh, 1908, uh, there was a survey conducted of uh, the systems that were used uh, around the, the, the world. Um, in Europe, they use very many systems. Germany is, is uh, notorious for producing uh, a large number of systems. Uh, Great Britain and, and France also had uh, a number of systems. And when I speak of systems, these are systems of reinforcing bars for beams, girders, columns, or girderless floors. In other words, you bought a system. You didn't have somebody go design it. Uh, independently and then contracted out. The owner of the patent and system built their structure. In the United States, we had a few. A couple of these made it to Europe. In particular, the Con Trust Bar system made it to Europe. If the beam and girder bar systems uh, oftentimes included welded wire reinforcement. Um, Certainly, the welded wire and expanded metal uh, construction was used in and as reinforcement for floor slabs. Uh, easily placed, readily placed, came in sheets, could be cut to dimension. Um, Khan also produced an expanded metal. And uh, the, in the lower right, you see a, a solid bar which it, when you send it through uh, selected shears can be expanded laterally and you get longitudinal and transverse reinforcement with this system. Welded wire reinforcement was used extensively in some one-way slabs and roof structures for many old buildings. We had a system called the pin connected frame system. Uh, these were frameworks for beams and girders that were pinned in the negative bending moment area to provide continuity. 
The stirrups were also fixed to the longitudinal uh, reinforcing bars with pins. So this it was uh, to mimic a, a truss, a, a truss, a steel working as a truss embedded in concrete. The Cummings loop bar uh, was a, a prefabricated system that came flat and then the, the stirrups, the looped bars, were bent up to uh, form stirrup reinforcement for uh, shear. And uh, the, to provide negative bending moment steel, you, know, you just simply threaded a, another basically smooth bar through the stirrup at the support. The, this was a totally a smooth bar system, so the, the stirrups were automatically anchored because they were looped. The uh, flexural steel had an upset end and a washer on the end to provide its anchorage. Core bar systems was unique in that it, it, had, it used a deformed reinforcing bar and some um, both vertical and inclined steel for the, the stirrups. These were not closed stirrups or even open stirrups. They were wires that were run longitudinally along the length of the, the longitudinal steel. So they needed a special fixture, which is in the, in the center part of the, of the figure number 40, to hold all those bars into position until concrete was cast. The American system of reinforcing it was uh, an extensive application of uh, reinforcing bars combined with wire reinforcement. Here, the welded wire reinforcement was draped from the negative to the positive bending moment areas to provide that reinforcing steel. It was used to provide shear reinforcement for the beams or girders and also for the tie reinforcement in the column. Expand truss were uniquely rolled bars, and the uniqueness is shown in that cross section on the, on the lower left. Uh, that's the way it came from the, the rolling mill. If you periodically shear the thin web and then pull the piece apart, you get um, a reinforcing bar at the top and the bottom and a shear bar um, to, to carry shear reinforcement uh, in, in a beam. So uh, it was automatically anchored because it was, it, there, was, there was no independent loose bar to uh, tie to loose, other loose top or bottom reinforcing bars. The Hennebeck system actually came from Europe. It uh, is considered what we call a loose bar system. In other words, all of these bars come to the site and then somebody ties a cage and puts it in place. The, the uniqueness of this was that the um, stirrups were all flat bent stirrups and the, the anchorage to the, the smooth bars used was that they split the end of, of, the, of the longitudinal steel to provide anchorage. The con truss system um, was actually tested by a professor at the University of Wisconsin by the name of M.O. Whitney. And we should know the name Whitney because we have from him the Whitney stress box for flexural calculations. Um, the con truss bar system was used for many beams and could also be used for columns. And if you find a column that doesn't necessarily um, indicate that there are any stirrups, it might be a con bar because what they did is they sheared the wings off and bent them toward the center of the, of the column and that provide bracing for um, the, the, the vertical reinforcing bar against buckling. We also know, knew how to design uh, two-way floor slabs uh, that are supported on beam and girders. There were methods to proportion the amount of load going to in each direction. And the table shows that if the, if the uh, aspect ratio was one to one, you had a square slab, then about half of the load goes in each direction. But when you approach an aspect ratio of two, it works more like a a one-way beam and that's fundamentally the way we still do it and if you look at the lower right the um, amount of load that is proportioned to the the beams or the girders was basically you, t you took that and you, you uh, uh, triangularly had loads uh, loaded on beams or cross uh, girders. 
The girderless floor was something different. It didn't have any protruding um, things below the soffit of the slab. It generally had a greater load-bearing capacity for a given amount of reinforcing steel and concrete. Um, it had greater fire-resistant capabilities because of a flat ceiling. With a, a beam and, and girder system, it was more likely that you could catch the, the heat or the heat wouldn't dissipate and flow away. Uh, so the girderless floor had a better fire resistance. There were certainly no obstructions to hanging any kind of mechanical equipment. It also allowed for some architectural features on the edges of buildings. We, you build a girderless floor without any spandrel beams so you could have windows that went from the top of the slab to the soffit of the floor above. Um, flat soffits were also better for a natural flow of air and the distribution of the air. And probably one of the reasons it got uh, some traction was it was greatly simplified um, formwork and speed of construction. And these are some cartoons showing uh, the different kinds of flat slabs that we, per we make today. This is the flat plate construction where the floor slab is just basically supported right on columns. This is a flat slab with a, a drop panel. When we get problems with the, the shear around the columns, we fake the slab out and we uh, increase the thickness to to, in, to take care of the shear stresses around the column. Um, when those shear stresses are really high and you want to take advantage of a bigger shear area, you can also add a cap hole around the, the top of a column. So this is a sketch of a uh, flat slab system with column capital and a, a drop panel. The flat panel with column capital is uh, one that was was used extensively by uh, one of the, the contractors, uh, Turner, and uh, the, the basically we uh, increase the uh, column size at the underside of the floor slab to uh, increase the punching shear area to take care of high shear stresses. Uh, we also now uh, have a, a lighter system, longer spans and heavier loads in a waffle slab. Uh, here, the, the, the system is really working as a two-way slab split system. It's, it's girderless, uh, but it, it has taken out the weight of the concrete in areas where it is, is no longer uh, needed and has a solid section typically around the column at, for a column head. Today, there's a new system out that replaces the uh, that is, is competition for a waffle slab. It's called the bubble slab. The bubble slab has got a flat soffit and uses uh, um, inflated um, spheres or ellipsoids um, embedded uh, at mid-depth of the slab, and then you pour concrete to, to form a, a flat surface for the, the top. It also reduces the, the dead load uh, somewhere in the order of 30%, and functions basically as a, a waffle slab. Girderless floors uh, were pr originally produced uh, with specific names. The most notorious one, I guess, is Turner's Mushroom Slab, but uh, his competition was a cantilever flat slab system, a simplex system, a Barton spiderweb system, and a Watson system. All of these were four-way systems. In other words, the reinforcing bars went uh, orthogonally between columns and also diagonally between uh, uh, columns. The uh, graph on the right-hand side shows uh, why Turner's was very popular because he, per he had uh, the least amount of steel per panel and uh, uh, although Turner's uh, floor system always was uh, in contention, and, and he proved his his load carrying capacity by doing load tests. Um, he eventually lost out to uh, an analytical method, which described how uh, two way slab systems without girders behaved. The Turner mushroom slab looked like this. Turner liked capitals, so he made capitals. Uh, 
uh, on, on, on top of his columns, and then the, so the soffit was girder less was flat, and you can see on the upper right a, a reinforcing bar pattern uh, draped from the negative bending moment area to the positive bending moment area in the middle of the, of the panel, and also some special reinforcing around the column to increase the, basically the shear capacity. Turner proved his his slab system worked by doing load tests. The middle picture in the, in the, on the bottom is, it says it, uh, that's a 1,000 PSI uh, load on that slab, just one panel, but it's a 1,000 PSI load on one panel. The uh, uh, picture on the right is from uh, a deer facility in Omaha, Nebraska, and here they actually look like, it looks like they uh, put Load, the load test included not only one bay but more bays to investigate the capacity in negative bending. Cantilever slabs, uh, the, the, all, most of these slabs envisioned the slab uh, being cantilevered off the column. So many of these have uh, four-way acting um, reinforcing bars. The cantilever system had a slightly different um, system of uh, reinforcing bars right around the column. Uh, and a simplex system took away the the uh, special steel around the column and just added some more reinforcing bars to uh, accommodate that. Barton spider web system, uh, the spider web is very appropriate. If the, you can see the the red right around the column, that was a continuous reinforcing bar in both orthogonal directions of a panel. So that reinforcing bar went back and forth. It was continuous back and forth in each direction. And if you look in the cross section, you also see that there's some of them that actually go down through the slab. So this system had essentially shear head reinforcement, a pretty uh, expensive system to, to construct, but uh, I'm sure this thing works well uh, to carry the shear to the column. The Watson system, again, an, another uh, system of four-way uh, reinforcing bars for a girdleless floor. There are also some, thing, some things called three-way systems, a moral three-way system, a circumferential uh, ring system, and some two-way systems. The moral three-way system actually had a special application. The special application was in uh, rail terminals. Uh, moral figured out that if he offset the columns, um, uh, by about a half a bay, he can get the uh, um, rails to switch from uh, one line to the other line, which ran between uh, offset columns, and hence the, the, th the three-way system of reinforcing bars developed. The circumferential ring system, I don't think this system lasted too long. I can just imagine somebody trying to place all these rings and the, the cost of uh, fabricating all these things, and then he add, and then in addition to that, they add uh, reinforcing bars spanning from uh, column to column, and I think even from uh, diagonally across the the uh, panel. The Acme two-way system is not too much different than what we do today. If you look at this, you kind of say, "Well, that looks like a column strip, and that looks like a middle strip, and." And that's basically what it was. It was a column strip. And you put all the, the reinforcing bars orthogonal with respect to the, the column lines. So today we've uh, talked about some old reinforcing bars and, and how they, what they look like and what the material properties uh, were and the fact that we haven't changed very much since 1911 in terms of our metallurgical properties. We've looked at some beam type systems. Uh, Basically, those are, are one-way elements, um, although in, in the latter part of the um, 19th century, we understood continuity, so we were producing structures that had a negative bending moment reinforcing, and then we also talked about uh, two-way slab systems, the girdleless floor. Um, these two publications, the, the two CRSI publications, will be posted on the um, concrete Structures TRG, and I'm, I'm assured by Peter Terrara that that will happen within the next week, and I am now open for some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Don. 
Um, the first question says, how often is there problems with the placement of the bubbles in the bubble slab? I'm not prepared to talk about bubble slabs. I'm talking about the history of concrete. I, the bubble slab um, is called, actually it's a, a voided slab. There, the bubbles are all uh, encapsulated in a, a wire cage. Um, you can construct them a couple different ways. You can put a, a, a layer of concrete down, a soffit, and then embed that cage to uh, keep it from floating. Um, you can also make a, a precast soffit and then anchor the, the cages that hold the bubbles in place. Um, I, I, as I understand it, uh, the, the bubbles are not supposed to float. And I, it, if, uh, if that's what you mean by the problems, uh, I guess I would say they, ha they have not been uh, a problem. And, and there's several uh, floor slabs and several buildings that were, have been constructed, one in Miami, um, one in Madison, Wisconsin, and another one in California that have used the, the bubble slab system. All right, thanks. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions um, right now. Don, was there anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap it up today? These old reinforcing systems are, are generally not a problem other than, the, you know, the reinforcing bars oftentimes deteriorate due to corrosion. Um, they're, they, they are, over-designed relative to our standards today, I would uh, anticipate that uh, you would see very few collapses of these kinds of buildings uh, or floor systems unless they get overloaded. If you have to evaluate one, um, I think that the information that we posted on the, the uh, concrete structures TRG will give you an idea as to how uh, what, what kind of uh, reinforcing steel existed. And if you have to evaluate bond and anchorage, uh, if you're working on a working stress design, uh, you can use 200 PSI as a, a, good, uh, a good value. Um, you can't use today's uh, bond and uh, development lengths because they are based upon the uh, uh, current deformations that are on reinforcing bars, which don't, uh, didn't come into, um, didn't become a specification until 1950. So if you have to, I suppose you could take a, a working stress and multiply it by some arbitrary number, maybe two, to get an ultimate capacity. Uh, or you can call Lisa Feldman at University of Saskatchewan, and she might be able to help you with uh, the bond stress of old reinforcing bars because the, she's doing some She's written some papers as well as uh, um, very interested in anybody's old reinforcing bar stress strain curves.